Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture. So today we are going through the Legal Studies HSC lecture. So before we get started, I just wanted to flag some of the free resources that are available just for your own benefit. So we've got hundreds of downloadable study notes for you guys to access. Also lectures, which um, you're watching right now. We've got a bunch of other lectures, so feel free to tune in and register for the lectures that you feel are relevant to you. Um, or that you, you know, for subjects that you'd like extra assistance with. Uh, we've got discussions with online Q&As. Um, um, for a sense of community or just to get your unanswered questions um, answered and sorted out essentially. We've got um, videos with engaging online revision, uh, newsletters to stay in the loop, your ATAR calculator if you have a certain ATAR in mind and you want to see if you're on the right track, um, articles with study strategies and tips, and heaps more resources. So feel free to um, check these resources out um, and the link is over there so that's where you can access them. Um, these are some of our paid resources. So we've got TuteSmart, which is online tutoring from elite recent year 12 grads. So again, just there to help you out um, if you have specific subjects that you'd like tutoring for. Um, you know, the tutors know exactly what they're talking about. They were experts in their subjects and they still are. So um, definitely check that out if you're interested. Um, study guides. So uh, these are just printed revision materials with top tips to help you get the best marks that you can. Um, so we have them for a range of different subjects from biology to English uh, with different text guides as well and finally Ed Unlimited which is um, basically one place which has hundreds of the top study guides in an online format um, so if you prefer to have your um, study guides online rather than a physical copy Ed Unlimited is the place to go again I've got the link there so atonuts.com forward slash register is where you can go to access those all right, let's get started. So my name is Uzma and today I'll be taking the legal studies lecture. So there, there are a few things that we'll cover today. The first thing is crime revision and the second one is essay writing and exam skills. So let's start off with revision. So basically we're going to start off by going through a couple of questions. So I'm going to put up a question on the screen, um, just give you a little bit of time to address the question and, and pick an answer and then we'll go through why of what the correct answer is and why that's the case. So the first one, who is responsible for determining a verdict in a criminal trial? Is it A, the magistrate, B, the judge, C, the jury, or D, the defense counsel? So the answer for this one is going to be C, the jury. So remember that there is a difference between a verdict um, and then the sentencing process, which is a little bit different. So the sentencing process of how many years, for example, if it is a guilty verdict, um, the sentencing process will be taken by the judge. Uh, but m the verdict of whether an individual is guilty or not is decided by the jury. Second question. What is the role of the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions? Is it A, to appoint, a to appoint defense barristers, to assign a judge to hear a case, um, to appoint a jury for a trial of an accused person, or to review the charges against an accused person? So have a think about where you've seen public prosecutions, the DPP, come up. Maybe you've read about the DPP in different cases. So I think about which one would work best for this. So the answer for this one is going to be D. They're going to review the charges against an accused person. All right, next question. Which type of hearing establishes if there is a prima facie case? So is it A, an appeal, B, a committal, C, a, co a coronial, um, or D, a summary? So what is... Prima facie. So if you don't, if you're not sure of this concept, um, after you've, uh, after we've gone through this, just read a little bit about it. See if there are certain cases that you can flag to, to read about, just so that you're more familiar with the concept. But essentially, the answer is going to be B, committal. So essentially, it's deciding if there are enough facts for this case to go ahead, or enough evidence for this case to go ahead, 
Um, because some cases, there may not even be enough evidence for the case to actually go through a hearing process, for example. Next up, which of the following is correct about a person's oh, right to legal aid when on trial for a serious indictable offence? Is it A, all accused persons have the right to legal aid? B, the right to legal aid is only available in the Supreme Court? C, defendants only have the right to legal aid if they plead guilty? Or D, a person has the right to legal aid if an injustice is likely to occur? So... Again, right to legal aid, um, just understanding where that's coming from, what that is. Um, uh, so the answer for this one is going to be D. A person has a right to legal aid if an injustice is likely to occur. Right, so um, legal aid is not something that's available to everyone. Your income, uh, you have like different types of tests. So you go through a means test, an income test, etc., to determine if you are um, eligible for legal aid. For example, if you have a lot of money and you're an accused person, likely chances are they're not going to give you those resources of legal aid. They may, they will give that to someone who cannot afford legal aid or a lawyer. Um, it's not only available in the Supreme Court, so it won't be B and C defendants only have a right to legal aid if they plead guilty, which is again untrue. Next question. A person is arrested for a serious crime. He exercises his right to remain silent before the trial. However, at his trial, he gives evidence that he was not at the crime scene. Which of the following is true? So have a think about, read the options. I would say pause the video here. Just have a look through the options and see which one you think is best suited to this specific um, hypothetical situation. And once you're ready, just click play again. All right, so the answer for this one's going to be A. The judge can instruct the jury that this evidence may not be reliable. Um, basically... Because this person has been arrested for a serious crime, um, they've remained silent, but at the trial they give evidence that they were not at the crime scene. Um, this may be obviously a little bit incorrect, misleading. Um, uh, it won't be B. The prosecution can indeed cross-examine. Uh, the jury can ask the accused why he did not raise... The jury really doesn't do that often. They don't really ask questions directly. Uh, that is not their job. Uh, the accused does not have the right to raise this evidence during the trial, which is again incorrect because if they are there um, on the stand, they are able to do that. Who must prove the elements of a criminal offence? Is it A, defendant, B, judge, C, jury, or D, prosecution? The answer for this one is prosecution. So it's the people that are bringing the action to court. They are the people that are bringing the defendants to court and saying, hey, look, you've done something wrong and I'm here to hold you liable for that. And because they are the ones bringing the defendant to court, they have the onus and the right, they have the um, burden to prove that they are correct um, and to prove why the defendant is indeed guilty. What is the first step in the criminal investigation process? Is it A, an offence is reported, B, a suspect is interrogated, C, a search warrant is issued, or D, some evidence is obtained? Remember thinking about what's the first step of the criminal investigation process. So this is where your syllabus knowledge becomes important in terms of the structure. The legal studies syllabus for crime specifically is structured in a way where it goes through the entire process of starting off with what a crime is and then going through the process of when a crime first occurs all the way to that entire process of sentencing, punishment, etc. So it's really important that you think about that structure because you will get questions like this one. Um, so the answer for this one's going to be A, an offence is reported. I think this is fairly simple. You need to first report, somebody needs to report the offence before you can move on and um, go through any of the other steps. Pat does not have a criminal record. He pleads guilty to a charge in the local court, which of the following is true. So again, have a pause of the video and then once you're ready, just come back. Okay, so the answer for this one is D. A magistrate will determine an appropriate penalty. Um, because they're in the local court, there's no judge. The judge of the local court is referred to as a magistrate. 
So because he has pleaded guilty, um, he has no criminal record, um, there is no jury, so the magistrate will simply go ahead and decide what is appropriate. It won't be a judge because there's no judge in the local court, there's no jury, um, and very unlikely actually to go to prison because he doesn't have a criminal record, he's pleaded guilty, it's in the local court, so chances are it's a small offence, smaller or summary offence. All right, now let's move on to sentencing and punishment and go through some of the concepts there. So Crimes and Sentencing Procedure and Crime Sentencing and Procedure Act 1999 um, is a New South Wales based legislation and applies across the state. So there are two things to consider. Uh, statutory and judicial guidelines. So what are judicial guidelines? These come from guideline judgments that were previously um, made by judges that are decided in the Criminal Court of Appeal in New South Wales. Basically, what judicial guidelines are is, let's say I've got, let's say you, you, you're looking at a case, let's say you, there's a judge and they're looking at a case and they can see that a, a similar case has established a five-year prison uh, sentence um, five years ago. So another judge made a five-year prison sentence for the same or the similar case, then this new judge will take that into consideration for this new case because it's similar. So judges read cases and pick the best examples of sentencing decisions before which therefore form judicial guidelines for the judge. So the aim is consistency, right? So we're trying to say if somebody's committed the same crime, um, if one person is getting 30 years and one person is only getting five years, there's a massive difference in those two uh, sentences. So we want to try and have more consistency in the process. There are eight judicial guidelines. So, for example, when someone pleads guilty to armed robbery, judges may wish to follow guidelines from R.V. Henry. Um, again, I've got a, a lot of cases in here. So um, there are specific cases which I will explain and others which I will simply leave there for references and for your own research, um, just because we don't have time to go through each one in heaps of detail. Moving on to statutory guidelines. So a statutory guideline is an act of parliament. There are a number of acts of parliament uh, which may wish or, you know, basically you may wish to or have to follow. Um, uh, the Crime Sentencing Procedure Act of 1999 is the uh, primary source of sentencing law. Again, these legislations are quite essential to keep in mind and I would definitely put them in your notes uh, because they will be really, really helpful um, in talking about in, for example, a crime essay. So the standard non-parole period for some crimes were introduced in that specific legislation, which was amended in um, 03, to include the standard non-parole period for some crimes. So non-parole means that um, basically a parole period is that you serve, let's say you have a 10-year sentence that you're serving out um, and you may have a, a non-parole period of seven years. So in those seven years, you cannot apply to be released um, under observation or just be released um, from prison and have something else that you can do, for example, home monitoring. Um, however, after that, those seven years, you have your parole period, which you can apply to do that. So some crimes have a maximum and a standard non-parole period. So armed robbery has a 25 years max sentence with a standard non-parole period of seven years. So mandatory uh, sentencing, sorry. So uh, this is uh, under the most um, cited legislation for crime, which is the Crimes Act 1900. It is a catalyst for change and a high number of deaths of police officers whilst protecting society um, led to one of these uh, concepts. So outrage in the community was um, basically present. Uh, media uh, basically noted a high incidence of uh, drunk disorderly behavior and violent offenses fueled by alcohol in the community. So an example of that was the death of Thomas Kelly and the perceived poor sentencing of Loveridge, two cases which again are quite commonly cited by legal studies students um, for this specific topic. 
Next up, we have um, the specific area that I was talking about earlier when I was talking about the high number of deaths. So they actually released a mandatory sentencing process. So under the Crimes Amendment Murder of Police Officers Act of 2011. So for murdering police officer, a police officer, an individual will receive a life sentence. There is no judicial discretion in this process. So the judge cannot exercise discretion or have any other say. Uh, a case that um, basically is present within this topic is R.V. Jacobs 2013. Um, it creates more serious justice issues. Um, so, for example, the Sydney Morning Herald in 2011 uh, basically released a article um, with the heading, Is a Policeman's Life Worth More? So if a normal um, individual that was not working within the uh, police department, let's say they were a doctor or a nurse or they were, a, uh, they were working in an office or they were working in a cafe, are their lives not as important as a police officer's? Um, because these people are still doing their jobs. They're still, um, you know, helping, I guess, the community run. Um, and so that was a huge discussion that came about when these, um, when this initial legislation was released. Um, and so the reason that I've got those articles in there is because they are really good to also uh, cite in crime essays as well. So the parliament is taking over the role of the courts because there's no judicial discretion. And um, if you remember, we should have uh, a separation of powers uh, with the legislative, judicial and statutory um, different powers, right? So um, when those collide, when they overlap um, more than what is inevitable, um, there can be serious questions in terms of whether we have seen an override of separation of powers and now um, we've got total and complete power, uh, whereas previously, you know, we would want to see it, I guess, um, be separated. So uh, uh, there was another article released saying get tough laws erode functions of justice as well. So you can also search up these articles and have a read of them and find specific quotes, quotes that you feel like you may want to also cite in your crime essay as well. So um, the other um, legislation that I was talking about earlier in terms of intoxication and assault um, is cited above. So in the case of RV Loveridge, um, they received a four years uh, four years of life increased to seven years on appeal after the death of Thomas Kelly. Um, and so the death of Thomas Kelly um, at King's Cross um, and a subsequent law reform followed in terms of uh, one punch laws. So the mandatory minimum eight year sentence has been cited and there are no mitigating factors um, so no factors that can reduce the sentence potentially and again no judicial discretion um, which again raises questions about separation of powers as well Next up, we've got the case of R.V. Garth. So this was the first person to be convicted under the new one-punch laws. Uh, Judge uh, Towns Townsden uh, was required to imprison Garth for a minimum of eight years before he would be eligible for parole. So he received 10 years altogether. Um, so what are the effectiveness and ineffectiveness areas that we consider? Well, first of all, it's effective because it deters other criminals. Um, from doing this so people for example who are intoxicated will you know or before they're intoxicated will keep that in mind that hey look I have to be careful nowadays into getting into arguments with people um, with assault everything like that so it's deterring people from um, engaging in criminal behavior and it reflects community values and standards so it's saying you know a lot of people believe in the community most people will say that violence is um, not the answer and violence should be punished so it's reflecting that um, ineffectiveness of mandatory sentencing so law breaches the um, ICCPR 
and the mandatory life sentences fall hardest on those who have come into contact with police the most. So for example, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the homeless people, etc. So those people already going through um, you know, a tough time in terms of social factors, not I guess weighing up against them um, and then mandatory, mandatory life sentences will just add to that and worsen that process as well. So um, the purposes for which a court may impose a sentence on an offender are to ensure that the offender is adequately punished, to prevent the crime by deterring um, the offender and others, to protect the community, to encourage rehabilitation, so just being able to um, I guess, reintegrate back into the community um, effectively and appropriately uh, to hold the offender accountable for their actions and to denounce the conduct of the offence as well as to recognise the harm done to the victim of the crime and the community. So let's go through a couple of the other areas there. So we talked about deterrence a little bit already. So it's basically discouraging people from committing the crime, same crime because they're going, well, the punishment is not looking very positive, you know, and I don't want to engage in that um, act because I don't want to be punished for it. So there are two types of deterrence. We've got specific and general. So it's important to understand the difference between the two because the syllabus talks about these two specifically. So specific deterrence is punishing an individual in a way that will discourage them from doing it again, right? So it's specific to an individual, right? Um, so for example, um, you have a case where an individual has done some wrong and the judge will then impose a specific penalty on them to try and discourage them from ever doing it again. General deterrence Basically, it's sending a message to the entire community that this law is serious and it will be punishable by whatever, a mandatory life sentence or a couple of years in prison or whatever it is. For example, those mandatory sentences for killing a police officer and for intoxication and assault in terms of one punch laws. Okay, next up we've got uh, retribution. So retribution is revenge, essentially. Um, and it's basically saying that whenever somebody's sentenced, they deserved that. Um, and so essentially, it's a form of revenge. So it makes sure that the offender is adequately punished, made accountable, and basically the, the harm is recognised um, in terms of what the harm has been to the community is recognised and then um, essentially revenge is taken. Now, rehabilitation is Australia's main purpose of punishment. They want to make sure that the offender um, has the chance to reintegrate back into the community and um, basically rehabilitate, not commit those crimes again, go on to live a life without crime. So reduce further offences by an offender, but does so by aiming to alter the views of the offender. So, for example, if they have... Um, you know, have had a past where they have had issues with um, substance abuse, then making sure that we remove them from the situation or rehabilitate them so that they um, no longer, um, you know, view that as something that they need or just move them away from those addictions. So it also aims to reduce factors that contribute to crime and reduce recidivism, which is reoffending by helping criminals make decisions that steer away from patterns of crime. So, for example, um, educational programs or counselling, alcohol merit program, which is alcohol rehabilitation. Um, so nonviolent drug offenders must participate in rehabilitation in combination with probation rather than submitting to incarceration. Um, so drug court has reduced reoffending or recidivism by 37 percent next up we have incapacitation incapacitation as the name suggests is basically making the offender incapable of recommitting a crime uh, because they are in prison they are physically incapable of committing that crime whether that be home detention community work license cancellation imprisonment which is the most um i guess uh extreme of those um uh, punishments so we've got home detention 
uh, which may be for lesser crimes or crimes where uh, the offender is not seen to be a massive uh, risk or a massive threat to society, um, along with license cancellation, for example, that's just making sure they're off the road if they have committed a bunch of road crimes, uh, crimes on the, sh on the road um, previously, for example, speeding, drink driving, etc. For example, Matthew Malat was given the max, sorry, minimum non-parole period of 30 years for murder of his friend with an axe. Um, during sentencing, the judge said that he remained a th serious threat because he s showed no remorse and seemed to enjoy being known as a murderer and little motive for doing the killing. So the judge, judge does not need... Uh, uh, sorry, a judge does not, sorry, sentence um, for the victim, but for the community. They do not need to engage in this sentencing process to simply punish the um, offender, right? They're also sort of going out of that and they're saying, well, this is for the entire community that is impacted. When a victim is hurt, when a victim is, you know, in a situation that you know is negative um it's putting the community at risk and the victim obviously is a part of that community so victims of crimes have rights per the nsw charter of victims rights um and victims and their families prepare and present a victim impact statement so a victim impact statement is under the crime sentencing procedures act of 1999 um, and victim impact statements are heard during the sentencing of the offender. Um, so they outline how they have been impacted by criminal activities um, in times where the victim has passed away as a result of the crime. Uh, their family can step in to give that statement as well. Um, so it gives the victim the opportunity to be heard. So again, going back to that concept of the balance between uh, victims, offenders and the community. So um, we've got some cases that we can run through. So victim impact statements uh, must be disclosed to defence prior. Um, in 2008, the law allowed for certain victims to give the victim impact statements via CCTV. Liam Knight gave a victim impact statement after suffering injuries um, to the head. Um, so that can be anything like how it will impact employment. For example, having a head injury may impact his ability to be employed, may impact his ability to then, following that, earn money to sustain a living. Um, so all of those things can be talked about in the victim impact statement. So Catherine Smith also gave a victim impact statement in regards to the effect of 30 years of DV. Prior to 2014, only the primary income, sorry, primary victim could give a victim statement, right? But now, as I've mentioned earlier, a family of homicide victims can also read out their statement. Um, catalyst for change in terms of this, the Kelly family were devastated when the judge couldn't take into account the victim impact statement whilst Loveridge used character references to reduce his sentence. So previously the case was that if the family is reading it out, the, the impact statement couldn't be taken into consideration, but, um, there was a catalyst for change. As mentioned, again, I would highly recommend that you do your research, additional research, if you find this case in interesting and would like to potentially mention it in a crime essay. Role of victim in sentencing. So crimes, sentencing uh, procedures and amendment uh, act. Uh, so the judge will now consider a family a victim impact statement. Um, this was used in the Robert G case. Um, so victim groups such as Focal welcome the new law as it can lead to increased sentences, allows the victim's family to be involved. However, there is no universal acceptance of this reform. So what are the types of penalties? Well, we've got um, a bunch of different penalties that are considered, uh, such as no conviction, caution, fines, bonds, um, suspended sentence, probation, etc. 
So, uh, Crime Sentencing Procedure Act shows that um, shows respect to the sentencing options available to courts for persons found guilty of offences. So, the a penalty most given is a fine and a bond, uh, thirty-five and thirty-three percent, respectively. Um, so, penalties under this law include home detention orders, community service orders, good behaviour bonds, etc. So new penalties under the amendment include conditional release orders, so they replace good behaviour bonds without conviction, um, intense correction orders, which replace suspended sentences, home detention and existing ICOs, um, and finally community service orders as well. So tough and smart justice reforms from 2017-18 was a catalyst for change. The catalyst for change was an attempt to reduce re-offending, which again is the main purpose of punishment in Australia, to improve community safety and support victims. So the stronger sentencing laws were introduced to make the community safer and to introduce the option of increased supervision of offenders released into the community. There will be a presumption that domestic violence offenders will either receive a supervised community-based sentence or be automatically imprisoned. Moving on now to young offenders. So a little bit of a background on young offenders. The correct the convention, sorry, convention on the rights of the child, which is also known as CROC as short form sets out the rights for all children and young people under the age of 18. Article 1 of the CROC states that anyone under 18 is considered a child. NSW defines a child as a person who is under the age of 16. Um, remember that the CROC is an international um, convention, which means that it is um, basically a guideline. There is no strict... Um, enforcement of this. Uh, in NSW, a young person is classed or classed from the ages of 16 to 18. Uh, they are different to adults because they are less able to make wide, wise des decisions or judgments. They're inexperienced in life, they're immature, and they are vulnerable people. So young person or young people tend to become involved in crime because of histories of neglect, low levels of educational attainment and histor histories of substance abuse um, wh where that can be also looking at poor parental discipline or supervision. Um, so p types of approaches to young offenders, there are two types of models that we look at um, and one more specifically that we look at. So welfare model, which is crime relating to social factors and assist in rehabilitation and the juvenile model, tough on crime with no tolerance approach. So um, basically we have got legislation, the Children's Criminal Proceedings Act of 1987, which basically covers children in crime and young offenders in crime and what we do in those cases. Uh, so the common law presumption of Dolly Incapax applies. Dolly Incapax basically means that a child in New South Wales that is under the age of 10 is incapable of committing a crime. They don't have physically, or sorry, mentally the ability to understand that they have committed a crime. So if they're under the age of 10, that is a conclusive presumption, which means it cannot be challenged. If they are between the ages of 10 to 13, then it is the legal presumption. So you are presumed that you are incapable of forming relevant intent to commit a crime. So Dolly Incapax still applies. So this, but the differences between the first one and the second one is if you are between the ages of 10 to 13, Dolly Incapax does apply, but it's a legal presumption, which can be challenged. So if the other side can prove that that individual committed the crime with intention, they knew what they were doing, that can be um, allowed, especially if you can prove mens rea. All right, so next up we've got um, prosecution must rebut the presumption, um, and this was highlighted in the case 
um, of RV LMW, which is one of the most cited cases when we come to young offenders for legal studies students. So from the ages of 14 to 17, the presumption of dolly income tax does not apply. You are now, when you're between the ages of 14 to 17, it's basically that you do have, um, you know, you do have an understanding of what you're doing. Um, and so you're not incapable of committing a crime. At age 18, you become fully responsible. Um, law reform is needed. Amnesty International campaign uh, for, uh, called hashtag rage, uh, sorry, raise the age following the Don Dale Royal Commission of Mistreatment of Young Offenders as Young as 10 in detention centres, which is really unfortunate. Um, so there has been a lot of backlash and outrage um, and a lot of people that are asking for law reform in this area. Um, in terms of rights of children when questioned or arrested, um, the law that details the rights of those when questioned or arrested is the Law Enforcement Powers and Responsibilities Act, also known as LEPRA for short. Um, so when conducting, conducting an arrest, there must be a use of reasonable force. It cannot exceed that. There is no um, very clear idea of what reasonable is. It's basically going to be determined um, case by case. So that is a really uh, loose term, really. So a police officer must also caution the young offender specifically on the right to silence. They must inform them that they have a right to silence because most people that are young do not know a lot of what they are uh, have the right to do and what a, a lot of what they don't have the right to do. You must provide your name in situations of driving a car, under 18 drinking alcohol in a public place, um, suspected witness of a serious crime on public transport or involved in a car accident. So the time limit of questioning is six hours, not including rest periods. So you do not have to go to the police station unless you are arrested. Um, so the right to have an independent adult, which is not police. Uh, it can be a parent, a guardian, a support person, whoever you would like uh, during questioning. And if you are 14, you can decide who the adult is. Um, confession can't be admitted into evidence without a support person. Um, so that can be, you know, a really yeah that's a really important point for police officers um because they could literally have a confession on tape but if there is no support person present then they literally cannot admit that even if they have all the proof in the world they cannot admit that into evidence legal aid will be provided without charge and merit means test they cannot strip search anyone under the age of 10 years old um, children under 14 can't be photographed or printed, uh, fingerprinted unless they have authorised, um, unless it has been previously authorised by the Children's Court and no DNA samples under 18 unless authorised as well. Let's look at the Corey Davis case, also known as the RVL LMW case. So 10 year old um, basically threw a six year old who did it, who knew he couldn't swim. Um, into the Georges River where he drowned. Um, so originally the case against him was dismissed, but there was enormous outrage in the media. So the NSW Director of Public Prosecutions took the case to the Supreme Court, charging LMW with manslaughter. Um, jury heard that LMW was immature for his age. He was more like an eight-year-old, so mentally, and found him not guilty in less than three hours. And so the media um, basically were outraged and released many articles such as this one saying, Boy cleared of killing, Sydney Morning Herald, 4th December 1999. Um, moving on to the Children's Court. Um, again, with this case, please do a little bit more research. I think this is one of the best cases that you can cite um, for young offenders because it covers a lot of the concepts that are covered in the legal studies uh, syllabus for young offenders. So, yeah. Children's Court Act of 1987 is a specialised court established in 1987. It deals with juveniles aged 10 to 17, but also those under 21 if the offence was committed under the age of 18. 
they must have legal representation. It's a closed court, meaning no public is allowed. Um, media is allowed, but cannot reveal the identities of the children. So they may just give a fake name um, in order to uh, abide by that. There's no jury. Basically, the reason why they have a closed court as a children's court is because it gives the children appropriate time to rehabilitate and to reintegrate back into society if they are publicly vilified and publicly exposed at such a young age it basically is very detrimental for their future to be able to live a normal life um, outside of that um, crime uh, criminal jurisdiction so any summary of a criminal offense committed by a child except a serious indictable offense uh, committal proceedings of any indictable offence where the child, where the accused is a child. Um, so, for example, serious indictable offences are heard in higher courts, for example, that of um, Corey Davis. Uh, then the Supreme Court, uh, you know, as it was murder, manslaughter. It can also be in the district court. And traffic offences are only heard before the children's court if the child was not old enough to hold a license. Okay, we've got Curry Youth Court. So this is a part of the Children's Court and deals with young um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander offenders. So it involves the family and the Aboriginal community. It is more informal, meaning you must plead guilty. If accepted into the program, the offender will attend meeting known um, attend a meeting known as the Youth Court youth Corey court conference so it's issued with an action support plan which they must follow for six months so overall the sentence will depend on the offense that you've committed um, and program is important as it lowers the overrepresentation currently present of indigenous youth sent to juvenile Penalties for children. So the harshest penalty you can receive is a control order, which is similar to imprisonment for an adult, except that the young offender is held in custody um, in a juvenile detention centre and can only uh, be sentenced to a maximum of two years detention, three if accumulated. Um, magistrate must give reasons why other punishments weren't used. However, control orders have no specific deterrent effect because there is high rates of recidivism, reoffending. Many of them will end up reoffending. Um, in the case of RVGDP, the judge stressed rehabilitation. However, there are exceptions to this general rule where a young offender can be said to have adult behaviour, where they look at more severe penalties. But again, this must be proven. Um, and if it's not proven, it cannot go ahead. Alternatives to court, so we've got under the Young Offenders Act of 1997, which again I would highly recommend that you cite if you get a, um essay question on Young Offenders. This is one of the most important legislations that you can cite. It provides the option of warning, cautions and youth justice conferences for young people. So these are known as diversionary options to divert them away from a life of crime. So young people who can can be dealt with under the Young Offenders Act of 1997 generally don't go to court or have a conviction. So this applies to summary offences or smaller offences and to some indictable offences, but not to serious indictable offences such as robbery or sexual assault. Under the Act, young offenders proceed through a three-tiered system of diversionary processes. So alternatives to court, what are the alternatives? Well, you can have a warning. So this is issued by police. If it's something minor that doesn't involve violence, um, no admission of guilt is needed. Police just record the name, day and place. There's no penalty or no criminal record. Uh, for example, swearing in public, just something that is quite minor, doesn't really impact anyone around you. Caution. Um, this is where young people must admit the guilt. It is issued by police. There is no criminal record. However, it can be taken uh, into account in the children's court. Um, it gets recorded and there is no more than three cautions. So, for example, damage to property or stealing. The YJC, uh, Youth Justice Conference, is the allocation to have a conference 
uh, which can be made by police or the court and are for offences that are more serious or where there are no more cautions available. Like a caution, the young person must first admit to the offence. They must first state that they have committed the offence and plead guilty, basically. Uh, to attend the conference where a support person like a parent is there, um, there is going to also be a justice uh, convener and a representative from the police and the victim may also attend. It allows victim to say how they are affected by the crime as well. What is the effectiveness? Looking at time, if a police refer a young person to YJC, the case is over more quickly and doesn't really impact their, um, I guess, life, especially as a young person. You're normally within education, um, and so it's important to not let, you know, things like this impact that because at the end of the day we are aiming for rehabilitation. We want them to have educational attainments um, and to go ahead and, and do something positive in the community rather than turn to a life of crime, uh, which, you know, education has shown to reduce um, cri criminal behaviour essentially. Um, money, so the YJC is more cost effective um, than a, a children's court. Uh, the victim satisfaction, so 88% of victims say that they would recommend the YJC to other victims and public support, so 87% of people agreed that victims should have the chance to talk to the offender about the how the crime affected their life. Um, the focus is on restorative justice and rehabilitation. All right, ineffectiveness. Two ways you can receive a YJC is number one, by police, or number two, by children's court. YJC is underused by police. There is more police discretion that is needed. Dr. Dawn, Don Weatherburn from Boscar actually stated that YJCs don't address the underlying causes of juvenile offending, which is something that should be addressed. There was also an alternative youth and drug alcohol court which provided counselling and rehab programs instituted of a control order but it was too expensive, um, used up too many resources and was axed in 2012. Now we're looking at international crime. So international crime is another topic that um, is within the crime syllabus. So we're going to start off by looking at crimes against the international community. So crimes committed by individuals and states which are seen as wrong by the international community. There are four different types of um, crimes against the international community. Number one is genocide. Number two is war crimes. Number three is crimes against humanity. And number four is crimes of aggression. So Thomas Lubanga in 2012 was convicted for war crimes using children under 15 as soldiers and crimes against humanity in the International Criminal Court. Crimes of aggression recently defined by the ICC as the use of force by one state against the other, not justified by self-defense. Transnational crimes are often um, involving two or more jurisdictions. So it takes place initially within one nation, but then have international law consequences in another, whether that be um, slavery, trafficking, drug importation, or people trafficking as well. There are main, three main crimes that we look at. We've got drugs, illicit arms trade, people trafficking, so transnational crimes are dealt with effectively at a domestic level, not charged with a transnational crime, but with a domestic offence. For example, slave trading is criminal code section 270 Commonwealth, is a domestic offence, whilst the transnational crime is human trafficking. Okay, next up we've got international crime. So the case of rv tang 2008 so this was the first slavery conviction in australia where she solicited 10 prostitutes from thailand and so slavery um was 
basically under the criminal code section 270 commonwealth was awarded to a 25 year penalty um maximum the case was taken to the high court and she was given 10 years imprisonment um the rv dobby case from 2009 uh the queensland hairdresser was sentenced to five years human trafficking under the criminal code um section 271 so this was the first case of human trafficking in nsw international crime so domestic measures so enforced and investigated by the afp the australian federal police if the offender is charged in australia the afp can't operate or investigate outside of this country so outside of australia um, any other foreign country is outside their jurisdiction um, however they do work collaboratively with other jurisdictions and mutually assist so offender will be prosecuted by domestic courts um, and this is under section 270 of the commonwealth criminal code it's slavery offenses and 271 is human trafficking international crime so extradition of offenders may be needed so extradition is the process by whereby one country surrenders a suspect or convicted criminal to another country to face criminal charges or sentencing under the extradition agreement a person who is believed to have committed a crime in australia and then they've been uh, they've run away or escaped australia and gone to another country because then that's outside of australia's dur jurisdiction they can't go and um, charge them in another country if that country um detains them uh and deports them back to australia to face legal proceedings that is the process of extraditing an individual in australia extradition is covered by the extradition act of 1998 commonwealth australia has extradition treaties with about 300 100 sorry 130 countries so Australia has ratified and enacted the Rome Statute of 2002, which established the ICC, International Criminal Court. The federal government passed the ICC Court, Act, or the International Criminal Court Act of 2002 Commonwealth, which ensures that Australia's domestic laws comply with the Rome Statute. All crimes listed in the Rome Statute include genocide, um, war crimes, crimes against humanity and crimes of aggression are all offences in Australia. The ICC can only prosecute a case when the domestic court can't or is not willing to do so. Australia has primary jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute crimes in Australia. International measures. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia was established by the UN Security Council in 1993 by Resolution 827. Their role was to prosecute individuals for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide committed by the Yugoslavia conflict in the 1990s. Um, so basically there's a specific tribunals for these specific crimes like genocide like crimes against humanity like war crimes that have been taken place the other one is that for rwanda which followed a similar suit it was established by the un security council in 1994 by a resolution 955 and it was to prosecute individuals for genocide um during the rwanda conflict of 1940 1994 from april to june the international criminal court it is a permanent court located in the netherlands in the hague it was set up by a multilateral treaty known as the rome statute in 1998 um, and it started to operate in 2002 so it has jurisdiction to prosecute individuals who commit genocide uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes and crimes of aggression. Each one of these have a different definition. Um, so please do research into what each one of these is for a more clearer understanding of the differences. It is a court of last resort, right? It's intended to complement rather than exclude existing national criminal justice system. 
they can only prosecute cases when state courts are not willing to do so, as I mentioned earlier, and the main responsibility is to investigate and prosecute these international crimes that lie within member states. So the ICC can only exercise jurisdiction where the accused is a national of a member state of the treaty, uh, the alleged crime occurred in the territory of a member state or the situation is referred to the ICC by the UNSC. Where the ICC convicts an individual, it can impose a sentence of up to life imprisonment but not the death penalty. Courts may offer a fine or forfeiture of assets and imprisonment, but it again depends on the crime and the severity of the crime. Effective for victim. So a present presents their views and observations before the court. In many of these cases, um, you know, the victims have gone through immense troubles. Um, so just being able to um, present that and um, demonstrate the suffering. Um, so some form of reparation uh, or compensation is granted for the suffering. And balance between retributive revenge and restorative justice trying to basically restore justice enables the ICC to bring criminals to justice and help victims rebuild their lives and that concludes the international crime component of today's lecture we're now going to move on to essay writing and legal studies um, and we'll go through a couple of tips and tricks on how to ensure effective essay writing because I know this is something that not everyone feels very confident with. So essay writing and legal studies is actually quite simple. You do not need to make your writing sound overly sophisticated with big words or complex sentences. Um, you will not be rewarded for how complex your sentence is. The sophistication in your writing rather comes down to your essay structure, your paragraph structure, and how well you develop and support your argument. So let's look at a few ways you can structure your essay. So number one is by legal and non-legal responses. So for example, the first paragraph could have a legal measure. So you assess the effectiveness, including case, consider how other, non, other legal and non-legal measures interact to alter effectiveness. The second paragraph could have your second legal measure. Again, repeat the same process and the same thing for the third paragraph. So legal measure, um, assess effectiveness, include case about how uh, it considers how other legal and non-legal measures interact to alter effectiveness. The second one is by cases. So for example, the first paragraph can be about a specific case, for example, the case of RV Loveridge, uh, where you talk about charge negotiation, mandatory sentencing, consider the judge's statement, legislation involved, involved in the analysis of the justice um, achieved for the victim, offender and society. And you would repeat this process again two, three times, four times, depending on how many paragraphs you're writing. And um, have different cases that work for you in terms of what the question is asking. And then we've got by effective, affected group, especially if the question revolves around something like what is the balance of victims, offenders and society in this specific process, whatever it is, then this could be a really good way to structure it. So you could start off by paragraph one, talking about the offender, consider the offender intensely, consider the rights infringed, or supported and the complications that may rise um, as a result of this. Second paragraph can be about the victim. Consider the victim intensely. Does mandatory sentences for the murder of a police officer match the severity of the experience of the deceased? And paragraph three, society. What does society gain from mandatory sentencing, for example? Is it a deterrent? Is it not a deterrent? What is the evidence? What are the facts? What are the articles that have been released? Making sure you're including all of those factors within that process. Next up, we've got stage in the criminal justice system. For example, you may have paragraph one, which looks at the investigation process. Paragraph two, which looks at charge negotiation and plea process, and paragraph three, which looks at the sentencing and punishment procedures. So note that this structure only works for a broad or general question. 
it will not work for all questions. So we, I've given you a bunch of different, I guess, ways of structuring the essay. Please use the one that makes the most sense and that will most sense and that will be done at your discretion. Okay, so now it's going now we'll do a little bit of practice of uh from the uh previous different structures that we've gone through. Um and think about how we can possibly or which structure we can possibly use to answer the follow following question. Sorry. So the question is, to what extent does the criminal trial process reflect the moral and ethical standards of society? Right, so this is from the 2020 HSC paper. Um, remember, you've got a bunch of different areas to think about. So you want to demonstrate knowledge and understanding of legal issues relevant to the question. These are things you will be assessed on. Communicate using relevant uh, legal terminology and concepts. Refer to relevant examples such as legislation cases, media, international instruments and documents and present a well-sustained logical and cohesive response. So for this question, I really want um, everyone to just take a bit of time. I'm going to uh, basically give you a little bit of time to think about which structure you'd like to use and then just have a go at creating a mini essay plan on how you would follow that structure and what you would talk about as well. So I'll basically allow you the time to do that now and then uh, in a little bit we'll reconvene.
Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to attempt that. If you'd like a little bit of an idea of how this would be marked, I would highly recommend that you go to the HSC marking guidelines for the 2020 Legal Studies paper and they will provide you a little bit of an insight as to what's involved there. Um, we're going to do the same thing for another question. Um, just to really... Um, reiterate what to include and how to go about this so the second one is a little bit different it's got a quote so the legal system focuses on punishing offenders rather than preventing crime assess this statement in reference to achieving justice through criminal processes and institutions so again i'd like you all to just attempt that have a think about what you can talk about and how you would structure it out from the ways that we've gone through earlier um, and then we'll reconvene in a little bit
Okay, so now we're looking at paragraph structures. We'll look at some examples. So first sentence, you look at, okay, judgment and response to the question. So for example, overarchingly, the criminal trial process is limited in its effectiveness of achieving justice. You can then elaborate on your judgment and introduce the criteria that will be used to form judgments on arguments. So while there are areas of extreme effectiveness, there are also many limitations of the criminal trial process. Such areas can be measured by their ability to not only balance the rights of victims, society and offenders, and reflect societal, moral and ethical standards. Then you can start to introduce your arguments and arguments and their um, different judgments. So, for example, these areas include charge negotiation and juries, which are highly effective, and legal personnel, which um, also is highly effective. Um, reinstate judgment. So, therefore, the criminal trial process is moderately effective in achieving justice. So, just a summary again of like the way that you can approach it so hopefully this also helps you in terms of future essay plans that you write out and full essays that you also write so just a little bit again of a summary for the previous one the previous questions that you've just worked on if you would like a little bit of um extra guidance as to what to look at and what to focus on um this is from the 2021 hsc paper so please do take a second to read through the marking guidelines for that as well so proposed paragraph structure. So you'd start off with um, stating the judgment for the argument. Then you'd elaborate on the argument, inc introduce, for example, relevant legislation, um, argue different perspectives through evidence, and then repeat for as many perspectives or otherwise three or four times, three to four times. Um, include your legislation, cases, media, um, documents, and international instruments. So making sure that you do have all of that in there will really help aid your response and make it stronger analyze all evidence using criteria using the criteria that you've mentioned at the beginning and then you want to state your overall judgment um, making sure that at all points you're always trying to link back to what the question is asking you to do if you're not if you feel like you're not answering the question the chances are there's a reason why um, that's the case and you want to sort of draw back and, and go okay what do i need to work on or what do i need to change in order to effectively answer the question and starting that process nice and early will help you when you do eventually get to the hsc it makes that process a lot easier where you will feel that it comes more naturally for you to be able to answer the question draw um, your own judgment and be able to effectively link back to the question um, within your paragraphs as well um, you can also state the overall judgment for example on overall law reform um, introduce needs or conditions for law reform for example if the question was based on law reform support these con conditions with LCM uh, lcmdi introduce law reform evaluate it state the overall judgment on law reform considering all perspectives and then um, repeat judgment all right, then moving on to the conclusion. So this needs to be short and straight to the point. So three to four sentences max, you're not gonna introduce any new points in your uh, conclusion. You're just summarizing your existing points that you've made throughout your essay. So it is basically a summary of the points you've discussed. Do not recount every point, there's no need. Um, and basically make sure that you're addressing the question by looking at, again, uh, by looking again at what your thesis is, what your argument is, and what you've done to be able to answer the question and what your final judgment is uh, for the question. So here is an example of paragraph. I'm not going to read it all, but um, essentially, if you are really uh, keen on just having a first a read through, because I'm going to break it down into smaller sections, just pause the video here and have a bit of a read. Uh, so starting off, we've got the overall judgment, which aligns with the question and the thesis. The question was about the ability of post-sentencing considerations in balancing the rights of victims, offenders and society. So here it says deporta deportation as a post-sentencing consideration is largely ineffective in maintaining a balance of justice for the community and the victim's safety and interest, as well as the rights of the accused. 
And we then move into a br brief background on deportation and articulate a uh, criteria being used to inform judgment. So um, while deportation can be resource efficient for the prison systems and protect the individual and community, it can encroach on the rule of law and justice as it can be incorrectly applied so the powers under a4 under the aforementioned legislation are occasionally incorrectly implemented resulting in the loose classification an offender as an um an offender as a non-citizen under m minor technicalities and somewhat ignoring the period of an offender residence in australia We've then got a, pro, uh, a judgment. So it proves judgment with, with different types of evidence, with many different types of evidence. Uh, the big area of feedback here is that the student did not focus on different perspectives, which is something you must do to be able to achieve a band six. So again, uh, I'd suggest have a pause here and just read through that and determine what's been done well. And again, how can you potentially integrate different perspectives to be able to attain a band six? Finally, reinforce judgment and relate it back to the thesis. So therefore, the applications of deportation by, legal, by the legal system is seemingly, seemingly inconsistent in achieving justice between victim, victims, offenders and society. Thus, it can be seen that while the concept of deportation as a post-sentencing consideration promises to ensure resource efficiency and the protection of the community, it can be misused, resulting... Um, resulting in a failure of justice resulting is a failure of justice in the eyes of the victim and community and violates the rights and freedoms of the offender so if we were asked for example explain the tension between community interests and individual rights and freedoms within the criminal justice system what could we write right so after each body paragraph please write parentheses in terms of the overall judgment if it would be effective ineffective moderately effective etc so this is again another activity that um, can be quite helpful i guess in just starting you off in terms of how to write out um, essays and what to include so hopefully after those examples this does not seem as intimidating as it would have been prior so what I might do is just give you a couple of minutes to just have a think about what you could talk about and then we'll reconvene. All right, so my final tips. So first of all, establish a game plan. As you study more units, whether that be crime, human rights, family, consumer, etc. Um, how will you approach the exam? So in order from front to back or the other way around to start looking at some of the exams where your marks are coming from. So crime, you get 15 multiple choice um, and your um, essay, your 15 mark essay. And then human rights, you've got five multiple choice in the short answer. And then the two options are 25 mark essays. Um, stay on top of your notes. So in legal studies, you do not have time to play catch up later on in the year. So you want to make sure that you're understanding the content, you're doing maybe weekly recaps of what you've learned, um, asking your tutors, your teachers, whoever it may be, um, questions that you feel like you know in areas that you don't feel so confident in making sure that you're doing um you know all the work that's required of you whether that be homework just extra catch up um and just don't leave it to the last minute because there is way too much content to be doing that uh, and start doing practice writing so this is hands down one of the main reasons that i was able to achieve a band six in legal studies so uh just yeah, just continue to do the practice. Uh, and, and if you do, you know, obviously that will aid you uh, tremendously uh, to be able to do the practice writing, to be able to write practice essay plans, etc. Um, so here are some final notes. So for example, juries, judgment, overall effectiveness. So something like this really to just help you practice. And that's all for today. Thank you so much for joining and I hope that you found this lecture helpful.